But the moment she finally gets out from under Silco's thumb, the first thing she does is commit an act of terrorism. What's left for her now except to just become the show's next big bat? Let me ask you, is shadow boxing an orchard family tradition? Cause you keep fighting a version of the show that doesn't even exist. And losing. Badly. Sure, you could say that Jinx is a monster of society's creation, and that her actions against the wealthy could be interpreted as karma. So, Michaela, I think you need to wash your hands. You had the point, and you lost it just as fast, you butterfinger moron. Meet Michaela Orchard, people. She has takes on media just as bad as Lily and three times more relevant. Until today. Apparently she made some videos on Lily's channel a couple years back, a segment she calls Michaela's Corner. Proving once and for all that the best jokes in life are the ones that make themselves. And wouldn't you know it, she made a video talking about Arcane Season 1, so we got a double feature today here, people. We got to break down Michaela's skills as a critic and gush over Arcane at the same time. Oh yeah, but before we get started, remember the golden rule, don't harass her, don't bug her, no biting, no going below the belt, blah 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 blah, good, good, let's get it on. You should know by now that on this channel, whenever the idea of animation for adults comes up, more specifically anything that isn't just a sitcom with utilitarian art direction, a brow is often raised in apprehension, because it usually ends up being just another anime with all the troubling modern trends of the genre, or something that's far more focused on animation rather than writing. Nothing that we typically want to invest a whole season's worth of time into. Damn, she even vague posts the same way Lily does. Is Michaela Lily's trainer? No, 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 not that kind of trainer, goddammit. The less this chick touches Pokemon, the better. In more ways than one. But yeah, she keeps saying all this shit about animation made for adults. You know, the show she probably doesn't fucking watch. True to her name, she doesn't show any examples of what she's talking about and sticks to fucking vague posting. Which is my favorite thing! Lots of people vague post in their videos. Lots of cunts. I mean, for all I know, any experience she has with any of the shows that she's talked about is probably just from watching Lily's freaking videos. If I'm wrong, she's doing a bad job at showing it. Some pictures representing your thoughts would be nice. Just saying. Anyway, let's talk about the entire rest of the video. <laughs> Wow, wasn't it great listening to Michaela say the blatantly obvious for five minutes? Cliff notes, Riot Games bad, Arcane good, links in the description if you don't believe me. Also, she apparently supports pirating the show, basically taking away potential money from a studio that seems to be on the up and up compared to Riot and their fucking shenanigans that they're already getting sued for. Then again, I guess taking away people's income seems to be Michaela's kink. <laughs> Just being a little pest. Yeah, it's just being a pest, poisoning them in the algorithm. That's the thing, when you get DMCA claimed, you get poisoned in the fucking algorithm. YouTube isn't set up to be aware that you've spent like 10 days, like getting, uh, that you spent 10 days being DMCA claimed. What it sees is 10 days of no views. And that utterly fucking poisons you in the algorithm. It poisons your future videos too, like, that nutjob's got, like, more videos up, uh, reacting to me. They aren't getting anywhere near the attention. And it's like, you can't keep doing this! Or, yeah, that's exactly what we're gonna do. It's like, you can't keep doing this! I can't? Check, does it again, just to check. Oh, no, false alarm, I can, I still can. Oh dear, I seem to have spotted a cunt! Good day! Yeah, YouTube, these two are abusing the platform. Please do your job. Oh, and if this video comes out after June the King's video on Lily, YouTube, do your job harder. Thank you, hugs and kisses, Kaiser Shonen. Now, given this setup, it's not hard to gather that this show very much has political subtext spread throughout. Subtext that is mostly spot on, but does tend to get bogged down with the whole both sides rhetoric because that just makes for better drama. 
Like, I can't really imagine a scenario where the driving conflict of the show couldn't have been solved with Piltover offering the people of the Undercity financial security, decent infrastructure, educational opportunities, and access to healthcare. It's very clear that the higher ups of the city failed the lower class and their police force is a bunch of crooks. And we know it's very clear because, well, Caitlin just freaking says it. But the moment it looks like they might actually get off their asses and do something about it, suddenly the blue haired teenager from the slums with an ass ton of explosives throws a surprise kaboom and sets the entire process back like 20 steps. Because heaven forbid we have a conflict as clear cut as the rich can fix the problem, they just choose not to. That would strike too close to, well, real life. Okay, let's break it down for a second, folks. It's the real critic challenge. First off, Jinx blowing up the council. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail just yet because Michaela puts her foot deeper in her mouth later, which is impressive given that's where Lily lives. But what I will say is that Jinx blowing up the council makes absolute sense for her character. She lives in the Undercity and was a direct victim of Piltover's fucking violence and cruelty. They've been trying to arrest her since the start of Act 2, to the point of eventually trying to use Silco, her only potential father figure left, as leverage in order to get to her, and said father figure died in her friggin' hands and this was his last wish. All of these things not only reinforces the themes of the cycle of tragedy and revenge throughout the show, but also gives plausible consequences for Piltover's actions. Actions that the show never strayed from talking about by your admission. Seriously, no matter what Silco and the rest of the Undercity did, the show doesn't give Piltover a free pass. Or did you forget the Civil War the first two minutes of the show started with? It's almost like the show's trying to facilitate that even in a clear-cut conflict of the rich are assholes, people on both ends can do fucked up things. Has Gundam taught you nothing, woman? Oh right, that implies she's seen it. Shame on you. But let's go even further. Let's go through your logic, or lack thereof, McKayla. Okay, McKay? Can I call you McKay? I'm gonna call you McKay. Let's say, for some dumbass reason, Jinx didn't pull a 9-11. The council gives Zon what it wants and give them healthcare, education, and financial security, all of which would take several months, if not years, to make. And I'm talking about at this particular point in the series. If they did it earlier, hell, there probably wouldn't be a story at that point. Food for thought. Anyway, never mind getting Getting the money to accomplish all of this or the materials to build these facilities, you would also need to assign people who are willing to work in a city that makes Detroit look like fucking lazy town. And during this whole process, you want me to believe that there wouldn't be anyone in Zon, especially those who lived through the mistreatment of Piltover like Vi, Savika, or Silco, <coughs> wouldn't pull the same bullshit Jinx did out of greed, resentment, or grief? Fuck no, the result would likely be the same. There are kingpins, crime lords, and everyone in between that benefit from being the neglected part of Piltover, especially after Act 2. Remember, the Enforcers rarely showed up in the Undercity because of the deals Vander and Silco made with their respective wardens. This means everybody's gangsta until Topside starts paying attention. Zaun becoming an independent city, or Piltover creating institutions in Zaun, would potentially weaken or even rob them of their power, and I don't think they're in the mood to give that up anytime soon. I give them a month before bodies start dropping and we risk full-scale war. Again. The only meaningful difference is that Jinx pulled the trigger sooner rather than later. Now, that's not to say that you can't make a good story with that premise. The problem is that McKay Mouse over here isn't explaining why the story's direction is a flaw, just that it's not exactly like in real life, even though it is. I mean, if Putin decided to change his mind tomorrow, I doubt folks in real life would give him the pass either, you know what I'm saying? Fighting to protect people that you love or businesses that you care about often means more to the common person than whatever greater cause you're fighting about in the first place. As I said, it's a cycle. A cycle not driven by who has the most money or the right politics, but by people who suffer in different ways and care about different things. The biggest problem with Michaela's assertions here, and as we'll go further into the video, is that she's giving the middle finger to the human element in all of this. Just to shit on the show for not doing something, it already did nine episodes straight! Of course the entire story would be solved if Piltover did their job. 
Congratulations, you got the point. Most of the council were so ignorant, uncaring, or tied up in so much red tape that they did nothing for the entire population rotting on their lawn. They took too long to give a shit, and this is what happens. It's not justified, it's not right, but given the scenario, what did you expect? The show illustrated this across nine episodes. It's all there, black and white, clear as fucking crystal. Learn better, Michaela, please. I generally like most of the ensemble cast, though I certainly like some more than others. And there are those I wish the show would do something a little different with. A good case in point is Mel. When I first saw this woman, my jaw hit the floor. Her design was immaculate, her voice acting is sublime, and her general vibe is real as fuck. Yeah, spoiler alert, she's going to drastically undersell her character for the next minute. Enjoy! Alas, looking past that, what she is given for the first half of the season doesn't really resonate with me. Her role, since her first appearance, seems to just be Jace's political mentor and coxa, I mean love interest. It's one of those awfully hetero dynamics too, where she's the one doing the hard carry for the vast majority of it all, in the name of her supposed attraction to him. Meanwhile, he does next to none of the emotional labor. Mel was trying to use Jace to gain more of a foothold on the council and advance Piltover to newer heights. This has been established with her from the very beginning. Her genuine attraction to Jace came after that point. And so did they, giggity giggity. But let's talk about Mel's character for a sec. Even though she did serve as a support for Jace, we still got a substantial amount of characterization from her. Arcane does this really, really good thing that the best of writers do, which has one scene serve multiple purposes at the same time, and all of it flying on all cylinders. Mel's very first scene alone establishes that she is on the council, that she's not only interested in maintaining her position, but forward-thinking ways to really put Piltover on the map an obvious setup for what's to come, and setting up dynamics of the council which we see play out to hilarious and nerve-wracking effects. All of these pieces of information serve as world-building at the same time as establishing her core personality traits, her cunning, opportunism, and ability to multitask. Do these aspects also serve Jace's development? No shit. Jace is the fish-out-of-water character. He's the third major protagonist of the show after Vi and Jinx. He's a scientist getting thrust into political power. Why wouldn't he need more emotional uplifting, especially from someone who's used to this shit? And it's not like he never tried looking out for her. You know, like the scene in the screenshot that you show? Thanks a lot, McKay. Let me handle this. For context, this scene takes place after Power Slam! But you know, Jace dipped in the middle of the night, Mostly because his homie was dying. Day after that, Jace approaches Mel, tells her what's going on, and both of them talk about their issues in an honest, emotional way. This was the very first time we got to peer into Mel's backstory, in fact, and Jace showed support for her. I'm in exile from my family. What? Why? I fell short of Madada's standards. I don't believe that for a second. Do you? You should be with him, Chase. We can't change what fate has in store for us, but we don't have to face it alone. It's a beautiful painting. Sure, she doesn't have to get as much emotional support from him as the other way around, but, you know, that makes sense, because her issues revolve around her mother and defying her legacy. Neither of which are relevant until two episodes later. And Michaela, I can't help but wonder where this hate boner for Jace comes from. Let me ask you this for a second. Why would an ambitious, young, caring woman in a position of power, who wants the betterment of her city, Fall for a man who's not some skeezy politician, who's incredibly intelligent, has access to technology that can save people's lives, and actually has some goddamn morals. As if you have any right judging when you married the chick who gets mad when her fans tell her to have some soup. I wish I was joking. Particularly, when, whenever the topic comes up that I am in fact sick and I am I that I'm ill, the point comes up that where people to say, oh, you should go to a doctor, remember to have some soup, like all that stuff. It happens like many, many times. So I'll get like 10 or 12 comments telling me, you should have some soup. And chicken noodle soup, chicken noodle soup, chicken noodle soup with a soda on the side. Yeah. I'm so annoyed that when I say I'm sick, my fans say, go have some soup. 
no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Why does that make you angry? Why? Have you considered maybe you're just a miserable piece of shit? Like a misanthropic narcissist who hates when other people have autonomy outside of you? Have you considered that, Lily? Fuck no, baby! But nah, Mel's the one who deserves better when fucking Alaska warms up. Cut to the second half, however, where we see Mel's mother and see their dynamic, and oh my god, this is so, so much better. Not only is her mother an absolutely phenomenal character, but their family drama is some of the most delicious exchanges I've seen in a show. And Mel doesn't take any of these backhanded, passive-aggressive remarks lying down either. She bites back, and it is glorious. These are the most enjoyable scenes Mel has, and I wish we got shit like this from the start, rather than just having her be Jace's crutch. God, this bitch. Michaela, if the source of Mel's mental and emotional hangups is her mother and the kingdom she's from, how can she have similar conflicts early on in the story when her mother isn't there? Listen, I love Mel too, and I wouldn't be against having more scenes of development with her. Yeah, I think you seem to have forgotten where you're standing. We're talking about freaking Arcane here. Within the first half of the show, we had so many characters, dynamics, stories, and developments all being interwoven one after the other, doing no no small part to the incredible pacing the show has. Every line of dialogue, every scene, every shot was carefully crafted with a specific purpose in mind. Almost no time is wasted, and the results speak for themselves. Giving any character even slightly more screen time or development can potentially cause a butterfly effect that fucks over the whole chessboard. And to meet you halfway here, I also love relationships where the development is on both sides. But typically, that's only possible in stories that don't have as large a cast as Arcane does, and all of which are incredibly well written. Mel is positioned as a side character, an important side character, but one nonetheless. Something that Michaela seems to acknowledge right after this clip. Of course, despite having an ensemble cast, this show does have main characters. Congratulations, you played yourself. Very complicated, influenced by a number of factors, and is very engaging. Which is what makes it all the more frustrating that this season seemingly ends with setting up a young woman whose mental health is in a downward spiral as the main antagonist next season. I got enough of this shit from Warcraft Riot, do you really have to do it here? I mean, never mind the fact that I can't say with absolute confidence how accurately Powder exhibits symptoms of what I assume is schizophrenia? Villainizing mental illness and trauma survivors is a trope poorly thought out at best and brazenly offensive at worst. Yeah, she never explains why this is, by the way. My guess is that she's saying that presenting those who suffer from mental illness this way will embolden the uneducated or the bigoted into doing some shitty things to trauma survivors and neurodivergent people in real life. Does this sound familiar? That's because it is. Here's the thing though. If this is your argument, Michaela, you need to get this through your head. In order for someone to do horrible things like this, they would have to do exactly what you're doing right now. Ignore Jinx's story. By your admission, the story did its absolute damnness to make Jinx a sympathetic character. From showing her parents dying in the beginning of the story, to her bond with Vi, Vander, and the others, to slowly getting groomed by Silco as a tool for revenge, up until the very end where she chooses the life that she has been smothered in. She is mentally ill, yes, but that exacerbates her other character flaws and circumstances. Her condition isn't presented as villainous, they're shown as sympathetic. We see the how, when, and why of what made her out that way, and it's tragic. This is why the ending of season one is so powerful. This girl was not able to move on with her pain because she never got the chance to learn how, and thus inflicts that same hurt onto others. If someone sees this story and decides to push the autistic kid down some stairs, it's their freaking fault, not the fucking cartoon. Most people understand the difference between fiction and reality, and given how those with mental health issues love Jinx's character, and she's basically become the face of the show, maybe you're the one who's got some thinking to do. Sure, you could say that Jinx is a monster of society's creation, and that her actions against the wealthy could be interpreted as karma. Well, he's fairly intelligent. But their actions that nonetheless stop Piltover and the Undercity from reaching an accord, painting this one woman as the source of all the city's problems. Ah! He's full of shit! <laughs>
Okay, so, Michaela, I think you need to wash your hands. You had the point, and then you lost it just as fast, you butterfinger moron. The show isn't painting Jinx as the source of all of Piltover's problems. She's the consequences of those problems, much like Silco and other characters. As I said before, the show never steers away from pointing out how none of this would have happened if the council had done its job. Why would this not be the case again with Jinx as the main villain? If she's the main villain, I have no idea. Or do you have that little faith in the show that is praised for showing the different perspectives of its characters and their ideologies? The same praise you gave earlier. Arcane is a serialized miniseries about different people from different backgrounds who are on different sides of the law, all trying to pursue their own goal in a setting that is surprisingly grounded for a fantasy story. Who wrote this script? Did Lily write this? Oh, you know what? That would actually make sense. After all, we know how assertive Lily can be. Uh, gamey gamer, I don't actually appreciate comments like that. I enjoy stuff all the time. It's not a rare occurrence. Yeah. McKay, you don't need to do that. Oh, right. You don't need to gang up on someone with me. Why are you so fucking negative all the time? This wasn't a problem for the vast majority of the show because it was made explicitly clear that she is a victim of Silco's manipulation worsening her trauma. Yes and no. Whether or not what Silco did can be classified as manipulation the whole way through or out of genuine affection for her, which is part of the intrigue of their relationship by the way, but who's fucking counting? It can't be denied that on some level Silco did manipulate her. But Jinx was still responsible for her actions. She chose to do many of the things that she decided to do even when it wasn't necessary. Also, wait, you do realize that Silco also has trauma, right, Michaela? Yet the show never painted him as the source of Piltover's problems either, right, Michaela? Oh, but I guess it's okay because he doesn't have BPD or something. How convenient. And you know what, that's the core of your problem. You keep coddling Jinx's character and actions. Instead of simply sympathizing with her, yet still seeing her as a villain, you know, like a normal person, or even a neurodivergent one, you see her as this doll who's supposed to overcome her trauma when that isn't what the story is about. You deadass said that it's unrealistic for the season to end with Jinx bombing the council, yet you do not see the realism of someone with an unchecked mental disorder, here's the shocker folks, doing something wrong. Watch a different show, you blind camel. But the moment she finally gets out from under Silco's thumb, the first thing she does is commit an act of terrorism. What's left for her now except to just become the show's next big bad? Sorry, which part of any of that last scene suggested she was out from Silco's thumb? Powder did the one thing she wished never happened again and killed their father figure. Only this time, the guy with his dying breath literally said that he accepted her despite her mistakes and never wanted to abandon her. That's why she chose to be Jinx. She couldn't stand living on as Powder after making such a huge mistake. So she finished what he started out of frustration, pain, resentment for the council, and a twisted but genuine affection for Silco. Let me ask you, is shadow boxing an orchard family tradition? Cause you keep fighting a version of the show that doesn't even exist. And losing. Badly. If there isn't a scene in season 2 where someone, preferably Violet, tells everyone that they can't just scapegoat this one girl as the only thing wrong with Piltover, I'm gonna be mad. Lord, please pray for the soul of this bitch. If you legit think that there is a non-zero chance that the show is going to scapegoat Jinx for Piltover's problems, you're too stupid to breathe, Michaela. I don't know what this whole deal is with your freaking elf waifu or whatever you mentioned earlier, but how about you actually engage with the story for once? Jesus, no wonder you want to coddle Jinx so badly. You guys have a lot in common. The only difference is, is that I sympathize with her because she can't move on from the death of the people she loves and a society that treats her like garbage while you got your back broken by World of Fucking Warcraft. Forget looking at things skin deep. The first page of a Google search has more depth in this video. The showrunners would have to be blind, depth, and have your and Lily's combined freaking brain cells to do something 
so stupid as giving Piltover a pass or not addressing the fact that they were part of the problem too. That's fucking Maverick. And you're fucking Maverick. For lacking faith in the writers this much over literally nothing. So yeah, uh, this show is definitely hyping these two up to be a couple. But is it enough? That I'm hesitant to answer just yet because for all the tender and explicitly romantic moments between them, nothing has yet to solidify. Oh my god. It's the Orchard's greatest enemy. June the King! I mean, build up. Build up. That's why I'm- that's their greatest enemy. That's what I'm talking about. It's made even worse when they're contrasted against Jason Mel, who do have a sex scene the moment they decide to become an item. That's too damn bad! These two are already shacking up when all Kate and Vi seem to get is dramatic pining. Yeah, they're women on a mission, but still. But still, these motherfucking nuts. Vi and Caitlyn are two people who seem incredibly unused to romantic relationships, being forced on a mission to save the city. On top of that, they've only known each other for a few days at most, with Vi in particular having a shit ton of baggage. Them slowly pining for each other makes sense. Mel and Jace, meanwhile, have known each other for several years at this point. You seem to hate the fact that they don't get a Brazzer scene like Mel and Jace do, showing that once again, you are underselling your Black Queen hard. Mel was the one who initiated. Mel is a collected, ambitious woman who knows what she wants and knows she can fucking get it. If it was left to Jace, that scene would not have happened. Simple as. Vi and Caitlyn are different characters from them. People, we know it really gets me with this video. Michaela likes Arcane, or at least acknowledges that it's a decent show, but she barely seems to like it for what it actually is. Think about it, what do you think is her ideal ending of the story based on everything we responded to in this video? Well, Vi and Caitlyn would have a shotgun wedding by episode 6, Jinx would overcome her trauma somehow after killing her father figure, yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. Mel would dump Jace for Tyrone, and the big bad government would get bullied into fixing the problem that wouldn't be immediately fixed. A simplistic, vapid, idealistic, happy ending where all her favorites get to live and all the shitty ones are left in the dirt. Continuity, consistency, characterization, thematic execution, Nada, amigos. michaela has got a point A and point B and all that other shit is in the way. And hey, far be it for me to say that Arcane is flawless, rarely anything is. There are aspects of the show's storytelling that could have been made better, a couple plot holes that could have been plucked up, but would you ask Michaela of all people to point any of them out correctly? Fuck no baby! <laughs> I'd assume not. At the very least, she does acknowledge the show is good, but much like Lily, she chooses not to see it on its level. These small, niggling issues, she calls them, are born out of stupidity, insecurity, and a refusal to look at the product for what it is. I have yet to see the other 19 videos Michaela's made, but if this is the best she's got, here's some advice. You either get better, or you stay in your corner. Then again, I suppose staying out of the game means she has way more sense than Lily does. At least she only embarrassed herself 20 times instead of, well, this many. As critics, our job is to explain our perspective honestly, and most importantly, judge the works we review for what they are. Not what fans want them to be, not what we want them to be, and sometimes not even the writer. What. They. Are. From the fantastic to the terrible, from fantasy to slice of life, TV shows and YouTube videos, the truth always matters. And the truth is, Michaela, this video needs another draft. Thanks as always people, another day, another fun video, and we got more on the way. Like, comment, and subscribe if you like what you see, want to share your thoughts, and want to see more. And if you're feeling real generous, support me on Patreon. For just a dollar a month, y'all can jump onto my Discord server. With Blackjack and Hookers! I know, genius name, came up with it myself. And you can get shoutouts at the end of each new video, if you're into that sort of thing. You want to see some behind the scenes stuff too? Feel free to throw in some more. Stay tuned.